Dobry večer. Hello, everybody. My name's Charlotte Higgins, and I'm the chief culture writer at The Guardian newspaper in London. And it is my absolute honor and pleasure to be here with you. It's my third reporting trip to Ukraine since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, and I have been so honored and so enriched and so inspired by reporting um, on Ukrainian culture, on Ukrainian writing, Ukrainian art, um, Ukrainian resistance um, for the last few months. So thank you very much indeed for having me here with you. It really is a, a great pleasure. So now just briefly to introduce the topic of today's discussion. In the year 2000, the year of Putin's ascent to power, Eva Thompson, professor of Slavic studies, published her book, Imperial Knowledge, Russian Literature and Colonialism, which demonstrated the role of Russian writers in building the myth of the Russian Empire. So why have literary critics failed to see Russia as a colonial power? How does Russian imperialist discourse differ from colonial discourse in Western literary tradition? What role can Ukraine have in helping people reread Russian literature through a post-colonial lens? This is our starting point, though I am well aware of the paradox of discussing Ru Russian literature at this wonderful Ukrainian festival uh, in the middle of a full-scale invasion of the country. And I suppose that my own personal confession should be that uh, I fear it's many years since I've read Russian literature, and although I have in my youth, and at the moment, my main concern, I have to say, is reading Ukrainian literature and trying to read, trying to learn Ukrainian and trying to read books about Ukrainian culture and history. And, and without disrespect to my own profession, I've learned so much from, from that process, um, more perhaps from reading journalism. So I think we should take as read before embarking on the panel that um, one, of, one, of, one of our projects can and should be reading widely, reading beyond the Russian canon, reading Ukrainian literature. That being said, Russian literature does exist, and what are we to do with it? And it seems to me there are a few possible avenues for this discussion. We can think about what has been the effect on the literatures of Russia and the Soviet Union's formal, former colonial possessions of Russian imperialist discourse. What effect has this imperial discourse, which is perhaps swathed in this amorphous romantic idea of the Russian soul, had to readers in the West? And how do readers develop Professor Thompson's ideas further to adopt a mature post-colonial critical framework for Russian literature? And are there ways of reading Russian literature against the grain of its uh, prevailing imperialist discourse? I suppose also a question for me is, what is this mysterious Russian soul that people keep talking about? It seems to fall apart in my hands whenever I try to consider what it really means. So just quickly to introduce our incredibly distinguished panel. Eva Thompson, who joins us online, uh, I'm delighted to say, is Professor of Slavic Studies Emerita and former chairperson of the Department of German and Slavic Studies at Rice University. Her book, Imperial um, Knowledge, Russian Literature and Colonialism, published in 2000, marked her out as really the matriarch of post-colonial literary studies in Ukraine and had a huge influence on readers here uh, and, and abroad. And it is a, it's a delight to, to welcome you to Lviv uh, Book Forum. Um, Oksana Zabushko in three dimensions. <laughs> The great Oksana Zabgushko is a Ukrainian writer, poet, essay writer, and one of the most energetic and passionate voices communicating on behalf of Russian literature abroad. Her works have been translated into more than 20 languages. Her most recently translated works, I think, are Your Ad Could, Ad Could Go Here, Stories 2020, and Selective Poems, also published in 2020. And um, it's just wonderful to have you with us, Oksana. Um, Thank you. Elif Bachiman. Um, Elif's first novel, The Idiot, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and for the Women's Prize. Her sequel, Eva Orr, was published in 2022. She's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2010. 
Her essay, Rereading Russian Classics in the Shadow of the Ukraine War, published in January of this year, was widely read here in Ukraine and on both sides of the Atlantic and caused a, a, a really lively debate. So it's also great to have you with us, Alif. Welcome. I, I would like to... Oh, do I sense that we have Pata also? Is that you, Pata, Shamulia? Are you there? I think we, we um, have a late joining um, panellist who we weren't sure was going to be able to make it, but we also, I think, have Pata Shamugia with us, um, a Georgian poet, twice winner of the Saba Prize. His debut poem, The Panther's Skin, published in 2006, referring to the medieval Georgian poet, poem, Night in the Panther's Skin, gained wide popularity in the country, as well as strong controversy with calls in the Georgian parliament to ban the book for its so-called disrespect towards Georgian literary tradition. We're absolutely, welcome to, absolutely delighted to welcome Pata to offer a Georgian perspective on the question of decolonization of Russian literature. Welcome, Pata. And my apologies if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. I didn't get a chance to check that with you before the start of the session. But I want to um, address the first question to Oksana. Oksana, you wrote an amazing, um, very provocative and strong essay in the, in the Times Literary Supplement in the UK shortly after the atrocities of Butcher were revealed. And you wrote in that essay... It was Russian literature that wove the camouflage net for Russia's tanks. And your contention in that essay, if I read it right, is that if only Russian literature had been read more attentively by Westerners, and not only Westerners, what has happened now could have been foreseen. And I would like to ask you, Oksana, you grew up in a Soviet education system, no doubt imbued and immersed and marinated in Russian classics. Um, can you give me a sense of, of what attitudes you were encouraged to adopt to the, to the Russian literary canon in, in your Soviet education? And, and how have you succeeded in kind of disengaging yourself from perhaps from those prevailing readings? And I know you were one of the first people to review um, Professor Thompson's book when it was published in, in Ukraine. So perhaps you could talk about that experience as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but my question would be, we have 80 minutes, right? So that <laughs> means you have to be succinct, and as I was perhaps didn't set a very good example. <laughs> well, so actually, you know, while you were asking me the, the questions, I was calculating how many minutes of this 80, you know, I can devour, yeah. So about 60, I would say. I'll try to summarize very briefly, as briefly as I can. Um, well, um, yeah. Um, I have to admit uh, that, um, I have to confess uh, that like uh, all the Ukrainians of my generation, I still know Russian literature better than the Ukrainian one. Uh, well, that's the doubtful privilege of what uh, Derek Walcott, uh, in one of his poems, dubbed as solid colonial education. I've got this solid colonial education, uh, first class solid colonial education, uh, yet unlike um, most of my counterparts, um, I was, um, I had an advantage uh, to come from uh, the family of Ukrainian intellectuals who uh, were specialists in Ukrainian literature, so I got a home education in Ukrainian studies since my uh, school years. It was a kind of a clandestine education, but it helped me to get um, Again, as opposed to Derek Walcott, 
I knew that I am not just this indigenous intellectual who is supposed to learn the superior culture of the white people to be able one day to, to become their equal. No. I knew that I do have a culture of my own. I do have a rich literature. I do boast a rich literature of my own, but the, that the most part of this precious heritage has been hidden from, uh, from me and from, from all of Ukrainians. Uh, so, um, so it is kind of dangerous. Most of these books were banned. Most of these authors were executed in their times, you know, and their names were deleted from uh, our textbooks. Actually, the presentation, the portrayal of Ukrainian literature in the Soviet education was very miserable. It was this, it was a typical, a very good case for post-colonial studies. Really, a very good case. And I am really happy, you know, to be, uh, um, I'm very honored and privileged to be on the same panel, to share the same panel with Eva Thompson, who is venerated in Ukraine as the matriarch of uh, post-colonial studies. Uh, she has really many successors here in, among Ukrainian literary critics. And, uh, and this... Um, this instrument, uh, like post-colonial, post-colonial reading of Russian literature, uh, for me became something that I've uh, inherited, you know, from uh, my uh, upbringing. Uh, uh, so. Um, studying Russian uh, culture uh, all my life uh, in the Soviet times and studying um, Ukrainian culture uh, for myself, because it was not an easy task, you know, you had to find the books, uh, you had to hide the books uh, found uh, and some, well, so it is still not an easy task, you know, after 30 years of independence, Ukrainians are still struggling to repropriate their cultural and literary heritage in full scale. The series of Ukrainian classics are now becoming the most trendy for in Ukrainian publishing. So they, they, this year they hit this stage, all the publishers say. Uh, so, um, so I did have this, I would say, well, double spectacles maybe even triple spectacles, because I was also having Polish from home. So I, uh, I grew up in belief that uh, Ukra a true Ukrainian intellectual must know uh, Russian and Polish, because a considerable part of our history was happening in these languages, and as, a, as an intellectual, you are supposed to have an access to all that. Uh, so, uh, this double spectacles or 3D picture, you know, really helped me, um, well, to see what for an ordinary Western reader admiring uh, Gogol or Bulgakov or Tolstoy, uh, Mm, oh, Chekhov, okay, I love Chekhov myself, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a long essay about him. Uh, well, so, um, for an ordinary reader, um, many things are not transparent, as transparent as they became, you know, after, after Eva Thompson uh, turned the light on. Uh, for me, as for uh, Ukrainian, of course, uh, you know this, um, I would say, colonial attitude or this imperial contempt towards indigenous people, uh, local people, uh, you know, somewhere in the landscape that is present in every, I dare say, every, okay, nearly every, to be precise, uh, 
um, to be academic, nearly every Russian writer. For me, it has been visible uh, as for Ukrainian, and uh, yes, I am sensitive, you know, to this kind of things which you may not notice. Well, like... Um, like, by way of illustration, I can mention here Bulgakov's uh, White Guard. Uh, the White Guard, which, uh, which is uh, presented uh, in English translation uh, more than once as a book about Kiev. A book about Kiev, a book about the civil, uh, Russian civil war in Kiev. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, while for me, <laughs> oh, you see. <laughs>
so, I mean, he left Bombay, uh, like Bulgakov left Kiev, but without, you know, any, uh, you know, bad feelings <laughs> toward Bombay for being, for being <laughs> Indian. Okay, okay, it's, okay. it's a, okay. Maybe let's not, okay, okay, let's okay. not get into concern okay, that the, the okay, British it's... Empire was better, because I'm not sure that's a very good idea. Yeah, I know, but, um, I know. Oksana, it's a kind tell of, me, tell yeah. me about what happened when, when Eva's book was, um, I mean, so I'm keen to, 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 to have, Eva to, to jump in, but I, I just want you to give a sense of, um, from your reader's perspective, what it was like, what, what effect Eva's book had when it was published in, in Ukraine. I mean, I know somebody who bought 30 copies of that book to circulate among his well, friends. Well, just, just one moment here. I know you have to interrupt me because the Zabushko sentences are going to last into infinity. Uh, um, well, um, but just, uh, just one moment. <laughs> Just one moment to finish the previous sentence. You know this about Bulgakov. That Along with Bulgakov, along with Bulgakov, the same events were described in Ukrainian literature by Pavlo Tychina in a long and beautiful poem, uh, the Golden Echoes, uh, Golden Echoes, sometimes Golden Roar. And you really, you know, when you juxtapose these two texts, uh, Tichina's text was banned uh, until, uh, um, until the independence. In the Soviet times, it was not uh, known, it was not republished. Uh, so uh, when you read this golden row, golden echoes, you know, and then you read this uh, chapter six in the White Guard, then you really know where you are. You know, you have this collision of two, uh, of two cultures, two worlds, two views, and you have these optics, uh, well, which otherwise you need to get through the text uh, with uh, methods of post-colonial studies and where, where Eva Thompson's book uh, really became an eye-opener for many and, uh, and in Ukra for, for the Ukrainian scholars, it was like, wow, that's it, that's it. So. Uh, so yeah, when it appeared, when it, when it was translated uh, into Ukrainian, uh, I immediately announced it uh, in my blog. I was then uh, held in a blog in, uh, on the most popular national resource of the time, and uh, Ukrainska Pravda. And, uh, uh, and yes, uh, well, I think, uh, I think it helped, you know, the popularity, uh, the popularity of the book, and um, the now, now it is considered a classic of literary criticism, and uh, and yes, uh, the uh, the scholars uh, who do now uh, their studies on Russian-Ukrainian relations, okay, they all you know, um, pay homage to Eva Thompson in their works, uh, and, uh, and dearly so. Wonderful, thank you. With that great fanfare, Oksana. Um, <clears throat> Professor Thompson, Eva, I would, I would love to turn to you, please. Um, I'm curious as to what led you down the road of, of um, starting this process of, of, of reading Russian literature in relation to imperialism through the lens of imperialism. I assume that Edward Said was lurking in the background there. And, and I'm also curious about the reception that the book received because um, I can't imagine it went down terribly well with um, certain professors of, of Russian literature, the guarders of the flame. Um, so, could you tell me a bit about that, please? Yes, well, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, thank Oksana for her warm words and her uh, ability to develop this picture that she did for us of Ukrainian literature being basically sidelined by Russian invaders. Uh, how, did I get, uh, how did I get to write about it? Well, you're right, uh, uh, Charlotte. I was reading Said. I was reading Culture and Imperialism. And I 
at some point I realized that uh, what Said says about British English literature, French literature, could well be applied to Russian literature. And why wasn't it? Why hasn't it been applied to Russian literature? And I can give you five reasons why it wasn't. Uh, first of all, at first, it was the remoteness, geographical remoteness of Russia. We today have quick communication, electronic and others, uh, and we do not see, we perhaps don't feel that Russia is so remote uh, from Europe. But it is actually in those days when this literature was written that I have uh, written about, uh, Russia was remote and people reading Western, reading Russian literature in the West simply didn't have an opportunity to check, to go, to see by, by them, for themselves how things were being done in Russia. So remoteness was one reason. It was simply something that we didn't know much about, we couldn't write about, and uh, that's why uh, at first nobody would even think of thinking of Russian literature as 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 colonial, uh, colonialist literature. Second reason would be that Russian colonists were not overseas, they were contiguous to Russia, to ethnic Russia, and this was something that completely fooled a lot of scholars for many generations, because it seemed that Russia was just rectifying its borders by attaching this to Russia, by attaching that to Russia. Think about it. In the 19th century, Russian, the Russian Empire, Russia, was increasing its land possessions by 55 square miles per day. Do you realize how much land that means? Russians attacked, uh, attached to, to, to Russia, that was, that was all colonies, that was not Russia, that was uh, somebody else's land, somebody else's culture being suppressed, and Russian culture being introduced instead. And here we come to the third reason for us in the West not being able to uh, notice at first that Russian uh, literature is very uh, colonialist. Uh, Russians renamed the territories they conquered. They renamed them Russia. And then when Napoleon was uh, invading the Russian Empire, we heard, and we still do, that he was invading Russia. False. He was not invading Russia. He was invading Russia's colonists. All the belt of nations in the west, uh, west of Russia was Russia, Russian colony, and this particular colony or colonies rather were trying to get rid of Russian domination of Moscow's domination rather than being part of Russia yes Russians tried to russify it and Oksana rightly said there is a difference here between Western colonialism and Russian colonialism but Russian colonialism tried to take away the nationality and identity from the peoples uh, it has conquered whereas in the West uh, the British let the inhabitants of India be Indians uh, remain what they were before. So here we have this idea that I am going to conquer this territory, I'm going to russify it, I'm going to take away the identity of the territory, and I'm going then to say we are the biggest country in the world, look at Russia, you can sort of show the country as being totally unique in the history of the world. And there's the fourth reason, and here it's connected to the third reason, and it's a very subtle kind of thing. Russia and the Soviet Union paid a lot of money to countries, to colonies, to Western colonies, so that those Western colonies of the West would get free of the colonial yoke of Great Britain, France, Holland, uh, Germany. How did they do it? Well, they sponsored the underground movements. They sponsored the uh, uh, terrorist organizations, and they managed actually to help a lot of movements in Africa, in particular, uh, to sort of gain power in a given territory. A good example is South Africa. Did you know that when Russia inv invaded uh, Ukraine, and there was a vote in the United Nations uh, to condemn Russia for the invasion. 
the Republic of South Africa did not vote to condemn. I think they said present. They didn't vote at all. Why? Because the African National Congress, which presently holds power in, in South Africa, has been sponsored financially by Russia for many, many years. And they sort of felt that it's the gratitude that they want to display to, to, towards the Russians. And uh, they simply couldn't afford in, this, in these circumstances to vote against Russia, to, to declare that Russia is an invader. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, reasons such as a lot of uh, actions like that, that made Russian colonialism invisible. And one more example here. Uh, in the 18th century, Voltaire, who was then extremely popular and considered a, almost you know, somebody who couldn't make mistakes in his thinking, Voltaire was, wrote a number of pamphlets against Poland. He presented Poland as a backward and uh, unenlightened country, a country where there was no freedom of religion, as opposed to Russia, where there was freedom and where there was the Enlightenment uh, rules were uh, implemented. Well, guess what? Uh, Catherine paid Voltaire handsome sums for writing these pamphlets. And these pamphlets were written when the partitions of Poland were taking place. So you can, you can get the end of the story by yourselves, right? The, the, basically, this was pure corruption. And when a Polish scholar named Henry Glembowski from Jagiellonia University went to Moscow and tried to find out, you know, documents and details about that, write about it. He was told that this is still a state secret. After two and a half centuries, the corruption that Russia has initiated is a state secret. Imagine how many other such things that are hidden in, in Russian in Moscow Empire, in Moscow archives. Uh, concerning Ukraine, concerning Lithuania, concerning all those colonies to the west of Russia. So all these factors work, worked against uh, seeing Russia as a colonial empire. And one more example, one more reason actually. There are scholars uh, in the post-colonial uh, group of scholars, scholars from Pakistan and India play a major role. We all know the names of Homi Baba, uh, Gayatri Spivak, Lila Gandhi, and so forth. And these scholars are adamantly opposed to the idea that there exists white on white colonialism. They believe that colonialism is only when the white man goes to the men of color and appropriates their country. Well, guess what? Russia is a counter example because Russia's colonies, certainly to the west of ethnic Russia, were all white people. Caucasus, same thing. In, in fact, very few uh, colonies of Russia were, uh, were uh, uh, oriented or were, were sort of consisted, <laughs> uh, were inhabited by uh, people who were not white. And this idea that, that colonialism can only happen in countries that are uh, non-white uh, has held many people back in, in trying to notice what actually Russia has been doing. So Russia has basically gotten away with creating an enormous empire. Russia enlarged itself to the west, to the east, south, and north. And as I said, 55 square miles per day. Can you imagine what enormous territory that, that implied? And it's still called Russia by the, by the people in Moscow. So these are the reasons why we are so late coming to the, uh, to this, uh, uh, to, 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 understand, to the understanding that Russia was a colonial empire. And you're right, Charlotte, I received a lot of, uh, negative comments about my book. Uh, people simply couldn't believe that I wrote such a, that you can sort of approach people like uh, writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy with, uh, with the accusation that they were uh, colonialists. Now, these are the very great Christian writers. Well, 
let me, if, if we have time, I, I could go through at least part of War and Peace to show how this colonialist gaze is uh, embedded in the novel, which is still a great novel, by the way. I don't want to suggest that, uh, uh, that Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or, or a number of other people are uh, bad writers, not at all. I think these are the greatest novel, uh, novels ever written. But that doesn't mean that a, that a great novel doesn't have in it the elements of, of colonial uh, uh, appropriation. So if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, War and Peace, you start War and Peace, you see a party, party being held in St. Petersburg. Uh, and who is at that party? Well, the very top of Russian society, not just nobility, very highest aristocracy. That's very important because we frequently think that, you know, the family, the, the family of the Rostovs or Bolkonskis or uh, uh, Bezukhovs was typical of Russia. No, this was, this is, you know, the 400 families of Russia. The, the, they're completely separate from real Russian society. This is not how Russian families act and behave. So in any case, there is this party for a small group of people of the highest Russian aristocracy. And we meet the characters that we've then be seeing throughout the novel. We meet Pierre Bezukhov, a sympathetic guy for by all, uh, by all measures. Uh, we meet uh, the Bolkonskis, we meet the Rostovs, not necessarily in person, but they're talking about them during that party. And we meet the women of the, of the novel. And so we, we meet a group of people we like. And notice that the second part of this, the next part of War and Peace describes those people going to war. Not the women, of course, but the men, uh, Bezukhov goes and, and Bolkonsky and, and Rostov. And you know, it's a natural thing for us to, uh, to feel that we, we sympathize with those people. We are on the side of those people. We are not on the side of Napoleon, just because we just met those people in, in the novel and we like them. So obviously they are in the right. So there's this description of uh, Russian army and Russian uh, people uh, as, as we go into the, this war part that again reinforces the sympathy that we have for the Russian side. Uh, how does it do so? Well, consider the descriptions of uh, Tsar Alexander I and Napoleon. Tsar Alexander is, re is presented in the novel by the narrator as sort of a knight on a white horse. He is adored, he is worshipped by his subjects. Uh, Nicholas Rostov, the narrator tells us, feels looking at Alexander that he would, would do anything for him. If the Alexander wanted him to go into fire, he would. If, the, if Alexander wanted him to kill a thousand people, including women and children, he would, because the narrator says he would do anything for him. So we get the idea that people worship Alexander, that he is truly the person that Russians adore. And then we have the description of Napoleon. Napoleon is presented as short, fat, and stupid. Now, we know that Napoleon was short and fat, but he also was a genius. And this is a very important element of Napoleon because he was a military genius that actually won one of the most important and, 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 and difficult battles in the history of, uh, in military history, the, the Battle of Austerlitz. So uh, Napoleon is presented as someone who didn't really plan that battle. And he did, I don't know that I have time to describe the battle itself. It was quite, quite amazingly uh, performed because uh, the Russian forces were on a hill together with the Austrian forces. Napoleon's, uh, Napoleon's uh, army was in the valley. So obviously the Russians had the power to go down on the enemy. Uh, and Napoleon had fewer people in his army than 
together Russians and uh, Austrians. And one inf this bit of information that Tolstoy does not include in War and Peace, who was the commander in chief of the Russian and Austrian army, because they had to have a, the same commander in chief, Kutuzov. In other words, this spectacular failure of Kutuzov is sort of war smoothed over. And then later on, Kutuzov is described as a great uh, strategist who finally defeats Napoleon. Of course, what defeated Napoleon was Russian climate and the winter and not Kutuzov. But anyway, here we are in Austerlitz. Uh, Napoleon tells his people to charge up the hill, which is totally was totally unexpected by the Russians and by the Austrians, because who goes, who, who does such things? That's suicidal. Well, Napoleon as a as a as a as a, as a leader, as a commander of this army, apparently risked the loss. But that's what being a genius strategist is. You do things that nobody else would do, perhaps, and, and you win. So he charged up the hill. He introduced confusion in the in the joint Russian and uh, uh, Austrian army. He sort of encircled them, and he lost fewer people in that battle than Russians or uh, and Austrians did. So uh, here you have this idea of describing uh, Russian leaders and Russian army as great as winning, which was not quite true in, in reality. In reality, the Russian army turned out to be a failure. The Russian, Russian command was faulty, and the battle was lost in, in a very spectacular way. So this is, this is you know, the kind of uh, introduction to us thinking that Russia is truly a great country and a great nation because maybe they lost at Austerlitz, but well, you know, then they won in Moscow. And by the way, Austerlitz, of course, is not an Austrian city. It's a classical case of, of, of appropriating somebody's land uh, and renaming it. You know where, where Austerlitz is today? is in the Czech Republic. It's called Slavkov. So that's what colonialism does, Russian colonialism and in this case, Austrian colonialism as well. It changes the names. It reintroduces a different culture on top of the native culture. It tries to bury the native culture, sort of to remove it from sight. And eventually, it tries to uh, russify, or uh, well, russify probably is the good word, uh, the entire territory. And as we move on uh, in, uh, in the novel, we see that uh, this pattern of glorifying Rus the Russian army, the Russian people, the Russian this and Russian that is, is very clearly uh, uh, imposed on us. As I already said, when Napoleon invaded, he did not invade Russia. He invaded Russia's colonies, which, by the way, were very much on the side of Napoleon. There's a scene in the uh, in Could the I just pause book. you there, um, Professor Thompson, and we'll, we'll, we'll come, we'll thank you for that wonderful close reading of um, the Battle of Austerlitz scene. Um, I just want to bring in um, Elif at this point, if I could, Elif. Um, <laughs> um, Elif, um, I mean, one of the things that um, Eva, Eva said very strongly um, in what she's in her, just, her statement just now was that um, these are the best novels in the world. You know, that um, in other words, I'm sensing that there's a space for, um, we may agree with that or disagree with that, but um, that there's a way of um, continuing to read these novels, but um, th through a post colonial framework. Um, through the kind of spectacles of um, imperialism that actually might be an enriching process rather than a diminishing process. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to ask you about your um, reading of these novels, um, which you've described in that brilliant um, New York Times essay has, has, I think, kind of quite radically 
um, changed over the past year or so. Um, have you, f I mean, ha how has that been for you? Have you found a way of reading Russian literature? Um, have you detected countercurrents in the prevailing um, imperial discourse of Russian literature that allows you to uh, see Tolstoy and Dostoevsky sometimes subtly working against um, prevailing imperial discourse? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that question. And um, I just can't say how happy and honored I am to be here on a panel with Oksana Zabushka and Eva Thompson, who are both so, I, I, okay. So I'm gonna start with, um, I'm gonna start with how I got interested in Russian literature, which was in the context of um, my upbringing. So I was, uh, I was born in 1977 in the US. Um, my parents, came from Turkey as scientists. And so I was a student in the 1990s. And the 1990s in the US were a time when even the political left was extremely um, apolitical. I, um, this is something that I didn't realize until later, but I internalized a lot of ideas um, that I now find very suspect. Um, there was an idea of the, the end of history that um, democracy had already won. There was a famous book by Francis Fukuyama that, um, you know, all we have to do is sort of sit back and wait to reap the rewards of global freedom and, and the end of racism. And I, I kind of believed that um, in a way because it was the trajectory of my, my family. My, my parents saw themselves, I think, as being a little bit post political and post-national and that they were scientists and they could go to the place in the world with the best science and study that. And this was not a political decision for them. It was about science. And I didn't learn to think about the politics of what country has the best science until much later. I also, I believed in the idea of meritocracy, which was that the, you know, which is kind of, it sounds nice, which is that, you know, if you work hard and, and, and quality is always recognized, eventually recognized in a fair society, and you know this is something that we really believed about the U.S. is that this is somewhere where the best things rise to the top, and you know so something like Russian literature, I you know I I saw myself as someone who was very free from ideological constraints. I grew up in a very atheistic household, a very sort of like. Um, my school that I went to was very proud of um, not imposing political views. There was an idea that literature in particular was free from politics and that uh, it was sort of small-minded and petty to have political readings of literature. And, and I basically believed this and I, um, I encountered Russian literature. I, I fell in love with Anna Karenina when I was a teenager and uh, you know, it. Uh, for reasons that actually you know, my therapist wants to unpack, but it's gonna be, I think, several years. He'll, he'll probably buy a yacht by the end of the time we got to the bottom of that. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I got we a little bit We could start now if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Not really. laughs> later, later, over <laughs> drinks. <laughs> um, so uh, so that, that was my situation and uh, that changed for me, it started to change in 2016 in the US, which was a, a year politically in both Turkey and the United States. There was an attempted coup in Turkey. It was the Brexit year. It was um, Donald Trump won the Republican nomination in the US and then he became president after he'd said these like preposterous things about you know grabbing women by the pussy. And it was just a nightmare. It was like, what, what is reality? Um, Meanwhile, that year, I had also uh, fallen in love with a woman for the first time after dating men my, my whole life. And uh, this was really a huge kind of ideological change for me. As a writer, I was always very interested in these kind of heteronormative um, stories. And I didn't really think about, I, I sort of assumed that it was, that something biological was happening. I didn't think about what cultural determinants. I basically, I saw myself as someone who was completely free, that I was lucky, the whole rest of the world, everyone in every other country is brainwashed, but here in America, we're free to choose what we want. And I've freely chosen Russian literature. I've freely chosen this life where I'm like, you know, pursuing masochistic relationships with the men. <laughs> <laughs> and, and none of this has anything to do with ideology or patriarchy or cultural structures. And then in 2016, I started this course of um, reading queer theory and, and um, second wave feminism for the first time and understanding that 
Um, the extent to which <clears throat> there's, there's overt indoctrination, which uh, you know, everyone in this r room knows really well, you know, where you're, you're directly fed propaganda, and then there's a, a different kind of prop propaganda that works through depoliticization, through making you think that liberation has already happened, and now it's just time to appreciate art, and we can all kind of like, you know, kick back in a, and, and, you know, read these great novels that have nothing to do with, with politics together, and that, you know, books like those are actually vehicles of, you know, it's Anna Karenina has to get run over by a train because she's in love with this guy. And I had thought of that book as a, I don't want to talk too much about, but I had thought of that book as a, um, not feminist, but I thought it's so clear that Anna is smarter than Vronsky, so Tolstoy saw that, and so it's, it's sort of like critical of, of patriarchy, but it's still, you know, her love for this mediocre guy causes her to get run over by a train, and that makes it a great work of literature, and it, it, you know, and I kind of perpetuated that in my life, which was having sort of misadventures over, you know, and I, I would see, oh, the guy isn't really worth it, but it was kind of like, well, that doesn't matter. That's not the, this, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this, like, you know, doomed love. Um, so then fast forward to 2019. So I was on this whole kind of journey of rereading Russian literature and thinking about the ways that it had indoctrinated me in heteronormativity. And uh, in 2019, I had the great opportunity to visit Ukraine for the first time. Um, and in preparation for the trip, I asked, uh, and I was, I was visiting, I was a guest of the Lviv Book Forum then, which was such an incredible experience. And I was a guest of Penn Ukraine, and I think it was Tatiana Teren, who I, I believe is here and is, I know she's moderating events on the panel, uh, who told me that you have to, if there's one book that you read, you have to read Oksana Zabushka's Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex. And that book, I, it completely blew my mind. <laughs> it was so amazing. It was so amazing. Um, I, I, don't need to tell, but just all the different layers of the way that all the different kinds of oppression are, are you know, y you say, oh, this is a book about, I don't know, it's a book about imperialist oppression, no, it's about gender, but you can't, it's all just the, the anyway, so it, it was a, a, I don't need to tell you. Um, <laughs> so then <laughs> I, I uh, then I came to Ukraine, and I was extremely ignorant, and uh, and obviously nobody here knew who I was, and it was presented as, oh, this is this Elif Batagon, she's an American writer, she wrote a novel called Idiot. <laughs> it's like, hello. So people were like, oh, interesting, you must really like Dostoevsky. And <laughs> it's, here's how we feel about Dostoevsky now. We don't really like his novels because we recognize the same rhetoric that's in the fake news that's justifying the seizure of Crimea. And I was like, I never thought of that. And, but I had just been on this whole journey of thinking about, you know, and at first, my first thought was like, well, of course, in this country, people feel that way because they're not objective. And then I was like, wait, who's objective? Me? Like, I'm, I'm the objective. And then I was like, what is this idea that anyone can be objective about literature and that there, there's any objective truth to literature? And then I thought, you know, I've been on this whole journey of rethinking novels through a feminist lens. And it was really, fieldwork in Ukrainian sex that made me think, like, of course, if those novels are reinforcing heteronormativity and patriarchal norms, of course, they're enforcing imperialistic norms, too, and it's just something I haven't thought about. So then I went home, and in my further course of belated reading from stuff that I should have read in the 90s that I read instead in the, you know, 2010s, I read Culture and Imperialism by Edward Said for the first time. And, you know, I'd read Orientalism, which is Saeed's book about um, the, the, Orient, the Orient, the East, in, in college. And I, we don't have to talk about that. So uh, culture and imperialism, it completely rocked my world. It's, even though it's, it has these very famous arguments that I now sort of, it's hard for me to reconstruct what it was that I didn't know, because once you see it, it seems so obvious. But there's like a very famous reading of Mansfield Park, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, where, which is a novel that I'd read multiple times, and uh, where he shows just by a few points in the text that actually Mansfield Park, which is this estate where all of the kind of important things in the book happen, uh, the the patriarch of Mansfield Park, who's this kind of aspirational character, who's the mentor to Fanny, who's the young in ingenue who goes there. He is, uh, he owns a plantation, a sugar plantation in Antigua, and he goes there to take care of some business, and then he comes back. And through the dates, he sort of proves that the reason that he went to Antigua was to put down a slave result 
um, revolt on the sugar plantation, and that this actually parallels a movement in the plot of Mansfield Park, and that the colonial order in Antigua is, um, that the order in Mansfield Park that is so kind of aspirational and that moves the plot of um, Jane Austen's novel is directly dependent on this slave economy. And then I thought, why hasn't anyone, I've never heard this about Russian literature, and I immediately started going back in my head and thinking about like, you know, Bronsky going to Serbia at the end of Anna Karenina and Tatiana's general. And, and then I was like, you know, I'm sure there's a gazillion, I didn't remember the Antiguan plantation. So I was like, how much stuff must there be that I don't remember from the Russian novels? And that's when I found uh, Imperial Knowledge. And I could not believe that such a book existed. And, and I, I was just, it, it was so incredible. You know, she, she goes into who Tatiana's general was and who Karenin was that, Karenin was based on this guy, Valuyev, who actually was instrumental in suppressing Ukrainian publications and Ukrainian language, and how just how intimately these themes are tied together. Um, and then that made me go on a, um, so then, then this actually happened before the full-scale invasion. And then when the full-scale invasion happened, I just felt completely sickened. And I had this feeling that, you know, people, knew this was going to happen, and they told me it was going to happen, and I knew it too, but I didn't completely, it didn't feel real, and then it suddenly, it, was, it just was like a nightmare. And um, so then I, I, and I remember the com it, that in, immediately Penn Ukraine um, proposed a, a boycott of Russian books, and then there was sort of an intra-Penn argument where German Ukraine, um, said that, that we have to keep our priorities straight and we boycott financial institutions, we don't boycott literature, the enemy is Putin, not Pushkin. And I saw that argument get a lot of traction in the US and, and there were a lot of people who I consider smart, enlightened people who were saying, oh, this is such a tragedy that literature is getting dragged in to politics and that, you know, and I, I just, I saw this conversation happening and it just felt like a constant gaslighting of Ukraine, or the Ukrainian geopolitical position to say that Putin has nothing to do with Pushkin. It's, it's, and it's, you know, uh, not to slight how much I loved Pushkin's work, but it's, it's a clear connection. So that's what made me want to write the New Yorker yeah, piece. That's a brilliant answer. And, and the, 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 you, it described so beautifully there that the thing that happens when you start to see the invisible ideological frameworks that are operating on your kind of worldview um, and what happens when you, you take you know, a different lens and, and look at the thing that you've regarded as, as natural as grass. Um, um, that kind of u sort of universalism that that you talk about in um, that, that you, you, well, you talk about in the um, article, um, but um, I wanted to ask: um, Can I bring you back in, Eva? Because I have got a I've got a very specific question for you, which is about um, a thing that you identify in 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 your book, which is. That there's, there's, an, there's another process going on in, you detect another process going on in Russian literature, which is actually about fear. Um, I should footnote this by saying, actually, it's public information that Pata is actually not going to be with us after all. Um, he has technical problems at his end, in case you think that I've completely forgotten about him. Um, so I'm coming back to Eva. Um, um, th there's another process going on um, very often in Russian literature, which is, um, not just um, an appropriation of uh, surrounding peoples and an othering of them, uh, othering of sort of indigenous peoples and a kind of appropriation of them as Russian at the same time, but also there is a process of um, fear of being othered in Russian literature. Um, if just to take, the, just to quote you, just to quote your book, you say, fear of being othered is always present in Russian literature. In Pushkin's time, it was not yet certain that Russia would succeed in overcoming the West's taxonomizing gaze. Powerful voices um, were still ready to treat Russia in ways not dissimilar from those adopted by Pushkin in regard to the Caucasus. Um, 
so the, 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 there's a process where Russian literature, in a sense, is afraid of being regarded as primitive or as inadequate, and that is part of the that is part of the process of adopting this the, the ideological clothing that we that we that we're all discussing. Uh, actually, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Uh, I just wondered if you could um, expand a bit briefly on the, this idea of Russia, uh, Russian writers also um, the part of the process of what's happening and, and part of the ideological process um, is, uh, is actually fear of, uh, fear of being regarded, of Russian writers being fearful as, of, of being regarded as inferior by, say, French writers, French intellectuals, English intellectuals. So there's not only, there's not only an assertion of power, but also a kind of cringe and a fear of, being, of, of, looking, of, of, of looking kind of Eastern or kind of primitive or distant from, from the kind of intellectual centres of Western Europe. Yeah, there is, there is this definitely, and I'm thinking about Turgenev, who was really a westernized Russian, if you, can, uh, if you can put it this way, probably the most westernized of Russian writers. And yet, he was regarded by, say, Brothers Goncourt as this strange man from God knows where, you know, here again, geographical distance plays a role. In other words, many Russian writers were afraid, and they were aware of the fact that they were looked upon by Western writers, Western societies, Western uh, intellectuals as aliens, as something perhaps not quite up to the standards of, of, of Europe. Yeah, they were afraid of that. And maybe the, uh, maybe the, the, the sort of insistence on, on putting down those uh, nations, tribes, territories that Russians conquered was somewhat uh, uh, was, was really prompted partly by this feeling that we are not quite regarded as, 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 as equal by Western writers. And if we put down those people, well, that will make us look equal. This is the way I read it. So yeah, there are several, there are many elements here, and there are many uh, contradictory sometimes influences on, 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 on Russian literature and what writers I have written. I would say that if there were not for the October Revolution, Russia was evolving and Russia was Russia was eventually going to uh, join Europe in, for better or worse. But the uh, revolution made Russia again into some alien, lower, and un un-European country, and you may see it in many writers that mature during the Soviet period. I cannot speak about the present point because I, I'm not that familiar with, with the Russian scene any longer. But I would say that, uh, that uh, uh, this, this oscillation between trying to impose one's vision on others and the fear that I myself will be regarded as lower by those Western uh, intellectuals is very much part of the Russian psyche. And I would say that this is better understood by people like Ukrainians who are close to, to the Russians geographically than, it, than, than by, say, writers from France or England, because those from France or England may not notice it because they're looking for other things. But do, the Russians do feel, do have still this feeling of inadequacy, this feeling that I must show up, I must build this, this palace so that it's at least as good as the French palace or uh, some other palace. There, there is very much this uh, uncertainty who I really am, and that. that Oksana, may... thank, thank you, uh -huh. um, Professor Thompson. I think, um, Oksana, that does speak to some of the things that I, I know you've you've thought about um, in relation to this kind of cringe, or you know, it's not just an aggression; it's a, a defence, um, perhaps. But I also. Um, Actually, I would like you to tackle this question because I think we're, we're, talking to, we're talking to the brilliant audience in the room, but we're also talking to a global audience. And I think it is uh, online, thanks to Hay Festival. And I, I still think that it is tough for people, zakordon, abroad, to, um, to, 
get this thing that really Elif has been talking about, which is that, that, um, that there, is, there is something to do with Pushkin in what's going on now. Because it, it, it's still, as Elif said, it, it's still the, the, the impulse to say, well, you can't drag, you know, there's a thing called the, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war now, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, and that's Putin's, that's what Putin's doing. But please don't drag wonderful um, Russian literature in it. You know, there's politics over here, and there's Russian culture over here, and Russian culture is wonderful, leave it alone. How do you, I mean, you must have tackled this over and again, but how, how do you respond to that um, desire to disengage c culture and politics? Well, I think, uh, well, I'm very grateful to Elif who, um, who explained to us how this whole Fukuyama-like, um, or Fukuyama-fostered mentality, you know, has been developing. And uh, um, I, I always get, uh, you know, some kind of cultural shock whenever asked by uh, Western interviewers uh, who have read my works in translation, um, asking me, and that's a very typical question, oh, you know, you so interestingly combine personal and political. And for me, every time, it is like, what? What, what, what is, I mean, I, I don't combine anything. Personal is political, political is personal. I mean, it is all in Aristotle and in Plato. Hey, I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's European tradition. Yes, its culture is agora, where we all communicate. Uh, a human being, you know, is a zone politicon, political animal and Everything is political. Language is political. Body is political the way it is used or misused or manipulated in different cultures. Well, actually, that's what you, <laughs> that's a wonderful example that you gave from, from your own life experience. Uh, so, um, uh, so this idea to like divide literature from politics, I mean, literature written with words, literature written, every word is dragging the whole history behind it. Uh, literature written with words, literature containing ideas, yes, and these ideas permeating in a very subtle and more than once perfidious way. The uh, action, uh, the thoughts uh, and behavior of the characters, well, everything, literally everything. So it is just the matter of this, uh, I don't know, very, very dangerous misunderstanding uh, that I think uh, opens the door for a new totalitarianism. Not Orwell-like, uh, but, uh, um, well, kind of, you know, this um, brave new world type uh, of totalitarianism where we all believe uh, that where we don't know we are in the matrix, yeah? Where we all feed the matrix with ourselves, well, with ourselves without our awareness. And speaking of what, um, coming back, you know, to, to your discussion with Eva, you know, while you were, while you were talking, guys, um, I thought of something else. Uh, again, um, the problem with it is not only with about Russian literature, but about Russia as such, about Russian culture, about Russian way of doing things. And writing texts is also one of the ways of doing things, yes. Um, you mentioned fear of, fear of being othered. I would say, I would describe it, uh, describe it as fear of otherness altogether. Russian culture, Russian empire, that's the characteristic of 
imperialism. It is absolutely allergic to otherness. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I happened to read uh, the, uh, the, the, an excerpt uh, from uh, memoirs of Christina Alchevska, a famous Ukrainian uh, cultural activist and pedagogue of the 19th century, one of those nation builders that, that every Eastern European nation was boasting at the time. Uh, so she, she met Dostoevsky somewhere in Europe uh, and they were having, they were conversing about how to liberate peasantry and about the differences between Ukrainian and Russian peasantry and, uh, uh, and uh, Alchevska said that Ukrainian peasantry is more advanced because, well, they are more individualistic, individual farming, the grown-up son is separated from the family and uh, a woman is treated like a human being that is a, a member of uh, a local community who has her own voice or something. And Dostoevsky reacted like, hey, and what's good about that? What's good about that? Well, uh, the, when the whole family lives together as obschina, uh, well, uh, well, then there is a unity. Once a grown-up son is separated, an animosity starts. So separation, otherness, means immediately animosity. It means, well, and animosity ends up with war. So everyone should be, well, the same. From Lisbon to Vladivostok, the world should look alike in everything. So uh, this fear of differences, this allergy to differences, uh, well, uh, instead of, uh, well, that excludes dialogue. Then that's something which not only, you know, Western readers can't grasp uh, in uh, the writings of the Russian classics, uh, but uh, much more dangerous for the face of humanity, Western politics were failing and still keep failing to get in the, in the negotiations with Stalin or Putin or whoever else, with the Russian leaders that uh, the understanding of uh, the, the, the total lack of the concept of a dialogue and uh, unless it is a vertical, uh, there is no win-win yeah. attitude. It, there should be a vertical with a patriarch up there be it the father of the family or Tsar or uh, Putin or whoever. Okay, and then this vertical of subjugation, you know, goes through the entire uh, structure, yeah. the texture of, of society. And that's, that's what we see, you know, in, uh, when, when we see, when we know it, Okay, then we can see this as, a, as uh, I would say, incurable disease of Russian characters. Okay, they so all lack of action. They lack personality, in fact. <laughs> okay, so I, my reading of colonial... I am trained in reading imperialist literature, right? And it's not Russian literature, it's Roman literature. And Roman literature is quite a handy place to read colonial literature, imperial literature, because it's a very long time ago and we're not currently subjugated. You know, Britain is not currently under the Roman Empire, so th there's less, there's no skin in the game. Um, and yet, of course, it's a fascinating, um, it's, it's a fascinating uh, thing to do, to read Virgil's Aeneid, the national epic of ancient Rome that contains um, and lays out and, uh, you know, almost codifies um, Roman imperialist ideology. And yet... And, and if Dido it only, gets it, crushed. If it, if it, well, it took, it, took, it took thousands of years to crush, right? It, it was a very... Dido, Dido and Carthage. Oh, yeah, well, this is, what I'm, this, is what I, this is what I would say, is that the, the, the reason that poem is interesting is that there are many countervailing currents 
to the overarching imperialist voice. That's what makes the poem interesting. You can detect the countercurrents, um, the way the poem undermines itself in terms of that prevailing imperialist voice. So can we get to a point in reading Russian literature where that is possible to detect those voices, those further voices, subaltern voices, inner voices, maybe suppressed voices that are hidden within, say, Tolstoy, or is that not a possible project? I don't know whether you want to take that, Elif. Yeah, um, I, so what Edward Said says about this in, in culture and imperialism is he, he addresses the question, so should we not read Mansfield Park anymore because it was, because uh, of the relationship to the slave trade. And he says, you know, no, the solution isn't to read less, it's to read more. We have to read contrapuntally, and um, by, by which he meant you have to read stuff that's uh, happening in Antigua. You have to read um, not just what, there's, so there's a, there's a tendency in Western literary criticism to treat the works of literature as being separate from the political opinions of the writers and to actually not look at their political ideas. And he's like, so we have to stop doing that. You have to look at what the writers actually said about all the things. And I think Oksana gave a great example of reading contrapuntally when she said, read chapter six of White Guard and then read The Golden Eagle. I think that's what you have to, um, it's, it's about expanding. I do think that those currents, I mean, you mentioned the Russian soul before, and to me, the thing that's sort of appealing about the idea of the Russian soul is that there's so much kind of self-hatred in it that's so relatable. Like there's this just this consciousness of being awful, which is, I, in a way, it's... Um, but I've been thinking about that too, because if you say, oh, I mean, I've been thinking about that because of your TLS, Oksana's piece in the, in the Times Literary Supplement about how Russian literature is always taking the perspective of the perpetrator rather than the victim. And if we're, there's something about, you know, if I'm writing a book that's like, you know, like peak Dostoevsky, like I'm a miserable man, I'm a horrible Cretan, and look at all the horrible things that I did. There's a, so you kind of want to give that person a pass. Victimizing a perpetrator, I would Sorry? say. Victimizing a perpetrator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I've just been thinking about that as a that mode of writing as a conservative force in literature, which is goes way beyond Russian literature. But maybe that's beyond the scope. No, of what I mean it's interesting. About. I think Roman literature does 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 in, it voices critiques of imperialism as such, um, and I'm, I, I don't know whether Russian literature does that or not, or whether that's something that we. We, we shouldn't look to Russian literature for, we can look to Ukrainka for that impulse. No, there is, there, there is a terrible lack of self-reflection in Russian culture. That's the problem, you know? So I strongly, I vote for, the, for Ukrainian literature not only because I am of course, I am, I am in, p interested personally, you know, in, in the number of the readers of Ukrainian li literature growing. Uh, but it was not my observation that to really understand uh, this hidden imperialism of Russian writers, you should read Ukrainian writers. Uh, and that's been the discovery of uh, my Western colleagues. And yes, if you think that, uh, in fact, in fact, um, the first anti-colonial, overtly anti-colonial poem in European culture was written in Ukrainian. It's Caucasus by Shevchenko. You know, while all these Russian classics, 1847, while, uh, you know, Russian classics were still describing the romanticism of the Caucasian Wars, Shevchenko addressed the tribes that were attacked and told them, Borite se poborete, fight, you will win. And uh, this is still, you know, something that is now appearing on the posters in the current Russian-Ukrainian war. So uh, a century and a half after, 
Well, these are still the words in action. So Thank you're welcome. Welcome to read and to translate more than, than uh, until that's now. That's such a wonderful, I mean, we're out of time, but I, it makes me so happy that we have ended this discussion on Taras Shevchenko and uh, whom we should absolutely be reading. And um, I, I long to see more Ukrainian literature well translated into English. So please hurry up, everybody, and translate everything. Um, and I um, would just simply like to um, thank my incredible panel, um, Elif Batshuman, Oksana Zabushko, and the legendary Eva Thompson. <laughs> <laughs>